If you haven't watched the previous training video on the message rule, I recommend that you watch it because these next two training videos, I got some different options to consider in a little bit different detail. So get the basics and then watch these two. If you have, well, here we go. This one's going to be about categorizing messages as they come in automatically. And so to create a rule to do that, come up here on the Home tab, go to the Move group, click on the Rules drop-down arrow, and you can't create a rule because it's based upon an email that you select down below in your inbox. I don't have any, so that's okay. In the previous training video, we learned that when we clicked on the Manage Rules and Alerts, you can come here and just click on New Rule. Great. I'm going to come down here and start from a blank rule that applies to messages that I receive. Select it, click Next, and then up here, from people or public group. Let me check it and then down below define that people or public group by clicking on the link and it opens up my address book for the well contacts folder or if you're connected to the exchange server the global address list and then down below let's do Mr. Humphreys double click to add him and click OK and then click next. Well you can add additional options here like okay if it's from Mr. Humphreys with specific words in the body, the subject, or body, or just specific words in the subject, whatever you want to choose for the conditions to be able to place categories on them like this is the follow-up category or this is my client category. In any case, let's go ahead and click next. I'll keep it simple here and then that's what we're going to do. Once it meets that condition that is from Mr. Humphreys, he will always be assigned to a category that after I check it, I can come down here to define the category by clicking on its corresponding link and he's going to be a client so he'll always be tagged with every email message I get from him. Now you can do more than one category. You can do two like maybe he's a spooky client and then go ahead and click OK. Click Next. Are there any exceptions like except if it's sent only to me or except if it's marked as importance? Go ahead and choose your flavor there. There's quite a bit to peruse through. Let's click Next, keep it simple, and then specify a name for this rule. I could just call it, let me delete that, Mr. H, a spooky client. In any case, go ahead and click Finish, whatever works best for you, and then click OK, and then we'll have Mr. Humphrey send us an email. So we can see that the moment we get it, come up here, click Send Receive so we can get it. There you go, right over there, the Categories column. He's been tagged, marked, and booked. If I want to right click on it to find out exactly what those categories are, you can see that they're highlighted for client and then also down here for spooky. Now if he's no longer a spooky client, you can go ahead and deselect that and you're just left with one category and of course you can always update that. But then again, if you do change it and you want to make it permanent and not have to come up here every single time that you get an email from him and deselect spooky, well you know what to do. If you watch the earlier training video, just come up here, click on rules, Go down to Manage Rules and Alerts, and you can go ahead and to edit this, you can double click on it to open it up, make the changes, or if it's selected, click on Change Rule, go down to Edit Rules Settings, rename the rule, you get some other options, delete the message, but you can do that right there. So let's go ahead and double click, come down here, click on Client and Spooky, he's no longer spooky, he's just a client, click OK, click Finish, and click OK. Be sure to watch my email message rule training video because this is an extension of it and it's about how to forward emails automatically based on certain conditions that you set. So for example, let's come up here on the Home tab to the Move group, click on Rules, and we can't create a rule because this one's based upon messages that are selected down below in my inbox here. That's okay, you can still create a new rule, just not based upon a message. And to do that, you can click on Manage Rules and Alerts, and then you get the New Rule button here. Go ahead and click on it. And step one, let's come down and start from a blank rule and say that we want to apply this rule on messages I receive. Click Next. And it's going to be from, let's check it, from People or Public Group. And it's going to have specific words in the subject, like let's say New Investigation because when Carrie sends me that email, I'd like to include Mr. Humphreys in on it, so instead of like after she sends it to me, maybe a couple days later, I remember, oh yeah, that's right, we gotta go ahead and include Mr. Humphreys. I wanna automatically done for me that the moment I get that from her, with those key words, it automatically forwards the email message on to Mr. Humphreys so he can get the option to be included in the new ghost hunting investigation. So, with these two conditions selected, Let's go down below and define those conditions, like with people or public group. Click on the link, and it's going to be from Carrie. So come up here, double click, and click OK. 
So when it's from her with specific words, and let's define those specific words, new investigation, and click add, it's got to meet both those conditions. It has to have new and investigation. Because if I typed in new and added it and investigation and added it, it could be either or. It could be like a new product, and Mr. Humphreys would automatically get that email. I don't want him to get emails with new anything. It's got to be specifically new investigation. So let's go ahead and click OK. Updates it down below. You want to change it, click on the link again. You can make your changes, select it, remove it, add some more. I want to keep it simple here. Then click Next. What do you want to do with the message? I want to forward it to people or public group. You can also do it as an attachment. I'm just going to forward it on here, a simple forward. Once I check it, go down and define that people or public group. Click on the link. And there's my public group, Homies, that we learned how to create a uh, public group in an earlier training video. But I want to forward it on to Mr. Humphreys, and there he is. Double click to add him down below. Or if you don't have him in your address book, like for contacts or any additional address books here, you can come down below type in their email address, and then don't forget the delimiter, the semicolon, if you have more than one email address, to separate those email addresses, and then click OK. Click Next. Are there any exceptions to this? No. Click Next, and then specify a name for this rule, Carrie Heffernan. Well, that's very detailed. Let's go ahead and delete that and say, OK, I'm kind of texting here. I got some abbreviations. From Carrie to me about new investigation subject, FW Ford, Mr. H. Let's go ahead and turn the rule on. Yes, leave it checked. Click Finish. Click OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and have Carrie send me an email message that has new investigation in the subject. Let's come up here. Click Send Received. Receive that. And it didn't come in the inbox. Do you know why? It sent it over to my personal folder. And it's right there, new investigation. And... It also, you see that blue arrow pointing to the right, looks just exactly like the forward option here. So it was forwarded on to Mr. Humphreys. To really know if it got forwarded on to him because it doesn't say it here, you can go ahead and double click to open it up and you can see it was forwarded on that date and that time, so just like seconds ago. But to find out if it really went on to Mr. Humphreys, remember, anytime you send off a message, even if it's done automatically, a copy of it stored in your sent items folder, and there we go, Mr. Humphreys new investigation. So what's the deal? Well, if you have more than one rule going on at the same time as I do, let me go back to my inbox here. It looks cleaner. Click on the rules drop down arrow, go to manage rules and alerts, and there we go. So we did this earlier that when we see investigation or research in the subject, move it to the personal folder. So it moved it, and then it went ahead and it forwarded on to carry when it saw new investigation in the subject. So we have multiple rules going on here to move and forward. You could just go crazy with all these rules. So if I don't want that to happen again, well, I can uncheck it, in which case it's no longer active. So when I get another email message, it just comes right to the inbox and it doesn't get moved over to the folder as it shows the action here, dumping it into a folder. Or I can delete it altogether. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do that and not have moved anymore and as well as not forwarding it on anymore for new investigations. And Mr. H is not a spooky client, so let's get rid of that. And nasty or potty words, they don't send me that, so I don't have to worry about that. And we have no rules. You can categorize your contacts by using color. Like, for example, let's say you've got 100,000 contacts in your contacts folder. And you want to be able to identify those who are your vendors, your vendor contacts, your company contacts, personal and church. I mean, I don't want to go through here and go, okay, Harry Potter, he's a vendor. Now, where's my other vendor? Scroll, scroll, scroll. You can go ahead and do a search, but in any case, there's a better way that we can go about doing this. I want to assign all those contacts for my vendors, like the color category gray, and then the company blue, personal green, church yellow. And then I can go ahead and group them by color categories so all my vendors will be grouped together by color, company, personal, and church. So I can just quickly go through and peruse through the vendors and not have to, you know, go through all this or type in a keyword search. So first of all, let's go ahead and assign a color category to our contacts. Select it. And you can see up here the current view that I'm in is business card. Click on the more button. You can choose whatever you want because it's going to be the same, whatever view that you're in. As far as coming up here on the home tab to the tags group, and remember I've got Sid the Sloth selected and then come up here to click on Categorize, and, well, he's already got tagged. He's a client. 
I can go ahead and deselect that or check something else. Now by default, the categories are going to have something like red category, yellow category, blue category, or purple. Go down to all categories, and then of course you can come over here and select the red category. Well, you don't have to check it. You can just select it and click rename, and then just type over it and call it my fancy pants category, whatever works for you. And then from here, once you rename it, or you can delete it, or you can click on new and type in a new name for a category and choose a fancy color. I'm going to go ahead and click cancel. You can also check or uncheck and check another category. Maybe Sid the Sloth is the happy event coordinator. So I've got a few of those. Click OK and he's been assigned that. So that was from the home tab from the tags group and you can double click on the contact to open it up. You can see happy events. You can come up here on the contact tab to the tags group which is available in the contact as well. Click on categorize and choose another. You can also right click on that and clear the happy events or all categories or choose another category. Of course it doesn't come with color once you right click on one that has already been tagged to it. So let me go ahead and close out and let's go to a different view. Change our current view, drop down to list. Because in our list view, I can scroll over here, scroll, 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 and I get my categories column. Oh, there we go. And right here, I can go ahead and right click and say it's apple picking and right click and also assign categories there in the category column. But the problem is, unless I have high resolution so I can squeeze more into my screen here, I just don't like to scroll. So what I can do is scroll back and then just click and drag the categories over and it gets closer. And then I have to scroll back and click and drag again, or better yet, what you can do. You can just come up here, click on the View tab, go to the Arrangement group, and click on Add Columns. Now we're not going to be adding columns, although you could, as we talked about in an earlier training video. But over on the right-hand side, instead of clicking and dragging, dragging here, just select it here, Categories, and move it up, 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 up. Okay, maybe that's too far. Maybe to full name, click OK. Jumps over there. Let's go ahead and scroll over. Okay, it makes it easier so I can tie their name to the category that they've been assigned to. And let me just go ahead and do a few more apple picking because, oh, happy events and oh, one Scooby-Doo audition ought to do it. Okay, maybe two. Well, spooky. And then what I can do from this point is that if I'm looking through those contacts that are on the ghost hunting team or part of the ghost hunting group, I could go, okay, there's ghost hunt. And then I have to scroll down. Okay, there's another one. And that's not very helpful. What I can do instead, once I have them categorized or color categorized, I can come up here on the View tab to the Arrangement group and group them by categories. Click on it and voila, there we go. All those who don't have categories are in one category, the None, and then you've got the Apple Picking, they're all grouped together. So if I just want to focus on the Happy Event Coordinators, there you go, they're all grouped together. It's easy to spot and compare and contrast and say, oh, that's right, Sid the Sloth is out this weekend, I gotta use, hey, I'm in charge, I'll go ahead and do it. Let's see, you can come up here and you can expand or collapse all the groups and then just expand them one at a time as needed. And then you can right click on it as well and say collapse all or you can expand all. Ooh, that's quite fun. And then if you want to go back to the way it was, you don't want to group them by categories, then up here on the view tab, we can go back to company and we're back to where we started except the categories wasn't right next to it. Well, you know how to do it. You can click and drag it all the way over to the right hand side to move it. Or just click on Add Columns so you can go ahead and rearrange it over here on the right-hand side. Or you can go ahead and select Categories and move it down, 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 down. Message that you get that Outlook considers as junk email will automatically move it right to the junk email folder. And so when somebody sends you an email message and they come up to you a couple weeks later going, Hey, dude, you didn't like respond to my email message for a party. You're like, yeah, you never sent it. They're like, as if I sent it and you just never responded. Well, you can come here to your junk email folder and you can go, Oh, there it is. I never checked it. If you want to go ahead and control the options of what Outlook considers as junk email, come with me, good neighbor, up here on the home tab to the delete group. And there you go. You can hover over it. The picture of the dude with a circle and a line through it, junk. Mark the selected items as junk or prevent items sent by the sender, the sender's domain or this group. Well, what it's saying is when you click on the drop down arrow and you have an email selected like in your inbox, you can block the sender, never block the sender. Well, we'll go over those options in just a minute. Right now, I want to control what Outlook considers as junk. Go ahead and click on junk email options. 
and on the options tab it says Outlook can move messages that appear to be junk email into the special junk email folder as I just pointed out. Choose the level of junk email protection that you want. Um, it's not really definitive here so for example you can say no that's the most definitive where everything gets through and that's not a good idea at least not in my book. You can do low which is my default here move the most obvious well obvious in what sense well what Outlook has built into its program that it considers as obvious junk email. You can get high and move like in this instance it'll probably move a lot of those things that you don't think are junk as I've done before uh, that it classifies as junk to the junk email so I keep it as low and then you get the safe list which means that only mail from people or domains on your safe senders list which is right here or your safe recipients list will be delivered to your inbox and we'll go over that in just a minute and then down below it's not checked where you can permanently delete suspected junk email instead of moving it to the junk email folder yeah that's major danger for me because there are many times where I deleted things that if it bypassed the deleted items folder I'll be like oh man now I can't recover that so I'd rather not check that for me and then down below disable links and other functionality and phishing messages where somebody's trying to get information from you so they send you an email with a bunch of links that when you click on it download something or triggers something and it could destroy your computer in any case I like this because once it's in the junk email folder it's like in a containment field it's not a hundred percent perfect but it's sure a lot better than opening up an email message in your inbox where it doesn't disable the links and other functionality so if you gotta open up an email message make sure this is checked and you open it up in the junk email folder as opposed to the inbox again the junk email is not a hundred percent effective but a lot more so with no protection by opening up in the inbox or another folder that doesn't disable the links and other functionality and then warn me about suspicious domain names in email addresses recommended that's fine so let me click cancel how does it get to the junk email folder like it says in Outlook if it considers it junk email it automatically moves it over there so let's say that I get an email and Outlook didn't move it over and I'm like that should be junk so like Mr. Humphreys I mean who's that well if I didn't know I could go ahead and right click on his email message and go down to junk and you get the list here as you see it up here when you click on that drop down list where you can choose from one of those options for me it's a lot easier to go ahead and right click on the email well not this one Mr. Humphreys right click on Mr. Humphreys and go down and from there saying okay block the sender or never block the sender, never block sender's domain, never block this group or mailing list. So this never block stuff means that if it's going in into the junk email and it's being blocked, you can go ahead and I'll show you how to unblock it or pull it out where you can right click and say don't ever do this again. But if I block the sender, automatically moves them over to the junk email folder in which case I select it and they're sitting there. When I double click to open it up, remember it disables links so if I come down here and I click on it it says uh, to help protect your personal information this message has been converted to plain text links and other functionality have been disabled to restore functionality move this message to the inbox well that's good to know because if you're like yeah I really want to click on this link to Hogle Zoo and there's the information bar links and other functionality have been disabled so it protects you and then that way you can view the contents of it and going yeah that's really junk email Whew, glad I didn't click on that link because boy that would have probably downloaded some nasty virus let's go ahead and close out so how do I get it back to the inbox if I actually want to click on the link to go to that hogelzoo.org you can click and drag it or you can right click on it and go down to junk and say it's not junk it says this message will be moved back to the inbox folder and it says always trust email from Mr. Humphreys you can uncheck it and just say well don't always trust it I'm just making an exception here but yeah always trust click OK moves it back to the inbox let's go back to the inbox there it is double click and I can go ahead and click on it and it takes me right to the hogelzoo.org let me close out so that's the junk email folder and the options in a nutshell but to go over a little bit more than what we covered here like I said with the selected you can click on the drop down arrow here you get the options or you can right click on it then go down to junk and you get the options so let's go down to junk email options and we cover the options tab the safe senders list where okay let me go ahead and remove these because this is from previous work that I've done but when you right click and you say look go ahead and treat this person as not junk it moves it to the safe sender list 
And if you want to go ahead and add additional emails to the Safe Center list so you know that when somebody says, hey, here's a new email address, I never emailed you, you never emailed me, can you go ahead and add this to your Safe Center list? So when I send you my email address, you don't miss out on it because it's in the junk email folder. I'll go ahead and click add and then type in their email address. Or you can type in their domain, meaning that anybody who's at that domain, like videotrainpro.com, it'll be considered safe and it won't go to the junk email folder. And of course, you can go ahead and edit it. If you need to update it, remove it, import from a file, export to a file. And by default, always trust emails for my contacts. So anytime you add an email address into your contacts here, it's going to trust it. It's going to consider it as a safe sender. So you can get emails. It won't put it in your junk email folder. So with this checked, you don't have to come in here and click add. You can add them to your contacts folder. That way you can add more stuff to it than you can here. You know, like their full name their phone number, notes about them, any other details. Then down below, automatically add people I email to the safe sender list. So if it's a new email, you come up here, click new, type in their email address, first time you're emailing them. With this checked, adds them here. I assume they ought to be safe. If you're sending them an email, I wouldn't email people that would want to spam me, but hey, I don't always know. Let's go ahead and go to the safe recipients. Email sent to addresses or domain names on your safe recipients list will never be treated as junk email. So safe recipients sent to the address as opposed to email from the addresses or domain names. So you get the option here for safe recipients to add, edit, remove, like on the safe senders, and then block senders. Okay, so when we right clicked on Mr. Humphrey's email, it moved into the junk email folder. Then when we right clicked in the junk email folder to say, no, it's not junk, you added them to the safe senders list. So we got them on both, but safe senders takes precedence over the block senders. So if I remove them from the safe sender, he'll be considered as somebody that we need to have blocked. So to go ahead and remove all doubt, let's remove it there. And so let's go to the international. Now for the international, you got these domain extensions here like .ca for Canada, .mx for Mexico. Sometimes a country, not the country itself that's bad, but there's one or two people from the country that are like sending out these spam emails. And if you're like, look, I don't know anybody in Mexico, and those who do email me are just a bunch of spammers, you can go ahead and block that MX, click on block, and then scroll down to MX, check it, or well, there's others here like Albania if you're getting a bunch of spam from that and you don't email or know anybody in Albania, click OK, and then anytime it comes through, it'll block it. I'm going to go ahead and unblock that because as of yet, I haven't gotten spam from Albania. Click OK. And then characters of each language are contained in a special encoding or character set, so you can block the encoding list when you get messages that are encoded, like from Arabic, Baltic, check that, click OK, to take it to another level. Let me go ahead and click Cancel. So Mr. Humphreys, let's go ahead and click and drag this over. They're videotrainingpro.com. So if I right click on this and go down to junk, as one last example, like never block the sender's domain because Carrie's from videotrainingpro.com, also Mr. Humphreys. And I'm like, hey, they're all good guys at videotrainingpro.com. Let's just not do this over and over again from all the people who send me email as I'm working with more and more people from videotrainingpro.com. Let's just do a one-time thing and say that the domain is cool. So never block the sender's domain. Click on that. The sender domain, videotrainpro.com, has been added to your safe senders list. Okay. So, well, let's just come up here and click on it. And go down to junk email options, safe senders. There you go. That domain is totally cool. So I can go ahead and get rid of Mr. Humphreys because he has the same domain there, videotrainpro.com, and we're good. I want to show you how you can change the default working days and times. So for example, the default is Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. You can see we're on a Friday, and there's 8. It's not shaded. So when I scroll up, well, before 8, it's shaded. Those are non-working times. And so if I want to go ahead and say, OK, our working days are Monday through Thursday, because we have a 4 on, 3 off, and the working times begin at 7.30 instead of 8. In any case, go ahead and change all that. Come up here on the Home tab, go to the Arrange group, 
Click on its expandable dialog box button to get the calendar options. There you go, Outlook options. You could have gone backstage and clicked on File and went down to Options. When you did that, you'd have to select Calendar for the category. In any case, it does it for us here. Since we're in the Calendar view and we expanded the dialog box, so with it selected, you can see the work time. There's the defaults, 8 to 5. So let's go ahead and change that and say we want to come in earlier, like 7.30 a.m., or you could get persnickety and do 7.31 a.m. Oh, that's just too crazy. Let's just do 7.30, and then click on the drop-down arrow and say we're going to leave earlier as well, like at 4.30 p.m. Then the work week is Monday through, not Friday, but Monday through Thursday. And then the first day of the week, well, it could be Monday. Maybe it's not Sunday for you. And then the first week of the year, I'm going to go with starting on January the 1st. Click OK. And if it doesn't automatically update, as it's not doing it for me here, like I said, I kind of have issues with Outlook here on my computer. Because I really haven't cleaned it up, I'd do one install on top of another. That's a whole other separate issue. So let me go ahead and just refresh it by going out to another folder, like the mail folder, then going back to the calendar, and going back to yesterday. Yeah, I'm working on a Saturday. In any case, Friday, and you can see, wow, everything's shaded. Why? Because this is a non-working day. So if I go back to the day before, Thursday, okay, it is a working day, but remember, we said that we're going to be coming in at 7.30 for the working hours instead of 8. So it's shaded down to 7.30, and then from 7.30 to 8, it's not shaded, and it goes all the way down to 4.30 right there. Cool. And so there's the changes there. Let's come up here to the range group and go to the work week. And our work week is Monday through Thursday. Four on, three off. What about the regular week? Starts with a Sunday? No, because we changed it and that our week is going to begin on a Monday and end on a Sunday. So there's the change there. And then, of course, you have your month view. And I want to show you that you can actually add holidays to your calendar in this case for the United States. I'll go over that in just a second, but let's go back to our day view because remember we had it in half hour increments like from 12 to 12.30 to 1. You can change all that by coming up here, clicking on the view tab, going to the current view group, clicking on view settings, and then select other settings, and there it is, the time scale. It's in half hour increments. So you can change that and say, ooh, I want it in five. Now let's do 15. Five would be too annoying for me and click OK, click OK, and it updated. So Thursday, let's go ahead and just scroll down to a, a working time here. Well, it's got it selected. You can go ahead and click up here. So we come in at 7.30, and then it's every 15 minutes. So there's 7.30 to 7.45, then to 8, 8 to 8.15, to 8.30 to 8.45, 9, and so on. So you can go ahead and schedule your meetings and appointments in increments of 15 minutes, or block it out, and increments of 15 minutes. And then finally, if you want to be able to install, let's go to the month view, the holidays for like the United States or for Uruguay or Europe or whatever country you're in, and then just come up here. Let's go to the, well, you can do it on the home tab because you get the arranged group there to expand it. Or if you're on the view tab, you also get the arrangement group that you can expand that. And it brings up the same window, the options window to the calendar category. And what we want to do is go down to Calendar Options to go on Holiday and click on Add Holidays and then choose your country. You can choose more than one if you'd like because it does earmark those holidays. This says United States for Easter. I'll just do one, click OK, but because I already installed it, it says, do you want to do it again? No. So I'll click Cancel, but after you click OK, it'll install it and then tag it. So like St. Patty's Day, double click. Location is the United States. I don't know other countries that celebrate St. Patrick's Day, except I think it's uh, Ireland. They might do that. If it's done on the same day, then they can go ahead and choose their country and you know show the location for Ireland. Let me go ahead and close out. And then to reset all this, which is what I'm going to do, I'm not going to leave it as is. Just go ahead and go to the Home tab. Let's do that, or the View tab. Go to the Arrange group, expand it, and go ahead and change it back to the way it was. Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, beginning on a Sunday. And you don't need to see this. This is just my beef. Now over on the left hand side you have the times here for your day, your work week, the week, but not for the month. I mean who can keep track of time for each day? In any case, let's go back to the day. 
And this is supposed to be representative of your time zone. And I also want to show you how you can add another time zone. So if you're scheduling an appointment or a meeting and, well, let's see, at 2 o'clock and you're like, okay, I want to schedule it with somebody back in New York, Eastern Standard Time. What's their time zone? What time is it going to be for them a couple of hours later, like 4 o'clock? In any case, to go ahead and add an additional time zone and to find out what time zone you're currently working with here, just come up here on the Home tab to the Arrange Group, click on its expandable dialog box button, and you go backstage in the options with calendar selected by default. And then just go ahead and scroll down to time zones. And there's my time zone, Mountain Standard Time, and that's right. And then the label, I could type it in here, but since I just have one time zone, it doesn't matter. But if I want to go ahead and add a second time zone, check it. And it's already labeled Eastern Standard Time. I mean, you can label it whatever you want and it's set to Eastern Standard Time. But let's go ahead and click on the drop down arrow so I can show you that oh look at all these different times you can go through so Eastern Standard Time you could call it EST or you can just say it's for New York Standard Time the label for me is Mountain Standard Time and then you can swap time zones so if I swap it so New York comes first and then Mountain Standard Time click OK and there you go there's Mountain Standard New York so when I want to schedule an appointment for March the 19th I could say, okay, I want to meet with them at 12 o'clock. No, they told me that they're not available until their time, 4 o'clock. So that would be 2 o'clock my time. Now you can go ahead and do it that way, you know, up here to the Arrange group. Click on its expandable dialog box button to open up the window to be able to work on those options or go backstage. But you can also right-click on the time zone. It's a lot easier, especially in the previous training video when we looked at changing or updating the increments. Right now it's in 30-minute increments over here in the day view. So if I go to 15 minute increments, it updates it. So instead of from 8 to 8.30 to 9, it now goes in 15 from 8 to 8.15 to 8.30, 8.45, then 9. It's a lot easier, right? In any case, I'm going to go back to 30 and you can right click and say change time zone. Click on that and then, you know, backstage, calendar selected, and then there's the time zones. So then I can go ahead and say, well, before I uncheck not showing a second time zone, I want to swap it because I want my time zone, Mountain Standard, to be there. And then I can uncheck New York or Eastern Standard Time and click OK. And we're back to where we started. Well, now we got the label, but hey, that's annoying. Right click and then update it, change your time zone, and then delete it. Click OK, and it's gone. The biggest obstacle that you'll run into when it comes to scheduling meetings with other people is to know whether or not they're available during that time. Now, if you're not connected to an Exchange server because, well, you can see I'm connected, but if you're not, then you won't be able to pull up other people's schedules to find out if they're busy or free, and then you play that tag game like, hey, here's a meeting, and they say, no, can't make it, and you're like, okay, when can you make it, and they propose new times. I mean, it gets kind of messy. The other option is, is that with a little help from your IT person, you can set up and use the free and busy feature that allows you to connect to another server, not the Exchange server. So with your IT dude's help, you can get the website address to that server so you can connect and publish your availability, like one month out, two months out of your schedule, to that server and be able to view other schedules as well to see if they're free or busy. And once you get that website address, then come up here on the Home tab, go to the Arrange group, and click on its expandable dialog box button. Calendar selected, that's where it took us. So we want to come down here to the calendar options and go to free busy options. Now because I'm connected to the Exchange server, it's going to bring up a window that you're not going to see when you're not connected. So let me click on it to show you. And if you're not connected, you're not going to see this window, but instead you'll see this window right here, the free busy option. And I brought this window up by clicking on other free busy. But again, that's because I'm connected to the Exchange so it brought up this window first, had to click on that to bring up this window. So when you're not connected, you only get this window when you click on the button behind it. So it says free busy information is used by people sending meeting requests to determine when you are available. Go ahead and check publish at this location. Take the URL that the IT dude gave to you, put it in here, and then you get the option to publish two months of the calendar free busy information. When it publishes it, it's not going to take your appointments or meetings and give anybody the details of it. It just says that at this time where it says apple picking for you, for them it's just going to say from 1 to 2, Kurt's busy. And that's all it's going to show. So that way he's busy and then when they want to schedule something they just look around for a time that's before or after it that I'm not busy. And then down below, update free busy information every 15 minutes. 
go ahead and set the time, and then the search location. So when you want to check out other people that are on that same server, if they're free or busy, go ahead and get that information from your IT person, click OK, and then let me click Cancel, click Cancel, and then you'll be able to view whether or not they're free or busy when you schedule that meeting. So for example, when I want to go ahead and schedule a meeting for Monday the 27th, when I double click on it, it's an all-day event, but let me go ahead and uncheck it so I can convert it into an appointment. And then I would type in the subject of it. Maybe it's footage review for ghost hunting. Of all the film and footage we took when we hunted ghosts the past several weekends, in any case, I want to come up here and click on Invite Attendees. And then I can type in the email address or, you know, click on the To button. In any case, if I want to find out if they're free or busy, again, I can type in their email address or I can come up here in the show group and click on scheduling assistant. Now, we talked about this in an earlier training video, and so this is what it looks like when you're connected to the Exchange server or also when you're connected to the same server and you want to find out if somebody else is busy during the time that we want to do this footage review. So you can see down here there's me, and then over for that time from 8 to 8.30, there's nothing there. It's clear. If you had some color there, then you can look down below at the legend. If it's blue, um, busy, maroon, out of the office, and, well, outside of working hours is the gray shade. So that's me, but what about Carrie? Now, since I didn't add her back in the appointment here in the to field, it's not going to pull her schedule up. So if I forgot to do that, you can stay in the window here and just come down below and click on Add Attendees and then find Carrie. I can come down here and say she's required to attend or optional. I'll say she's required. Click on the button and click OK. Answer updates it and you can see that she's clear for Tuesday, March the 27th. But if I pick a day just for laughs and I said, well, Saturday updates it and we get the gray here. You can see down below outside of working hours. So it won't prevent you from scheduling this with her, but it's a heads up saying, hey, she doesn't come in during these times. And even if she was busy, you can go ahead and schedule it. Again, it's not going to prevent you. It's a heads up. Don't expect her to say, oh yeah, I'm going to drop everything and come when she's already busy. Again, we covered this in an earlier training video, so I'll keep it really short. And you can go watch that other training video when it comes to scheduling meetings here and when you're connected to the Exchange server. So if you want to come down here and update the date, we did that. The times, you can change it there. You can also hover over the borders and click and drag to stretch it out. And you can see it's from 4.30 p.m. to 8 a.m. because we're going from Saturday night to Sunday morning. Oh, that's just crazy. In any case, you can move around, click in the center, and drag it over as well. And it stretches without you having to hover over it, the timeout. So now it's an hour. And then you can go back to appointment, and it's from 8 to 9, and it updates it here as well. And because she's free, at least from our scheduling assistant, we can go ahead and send this off and not expect that she won't be able to attend unless something unforeseen comes up. By default, you only get one calendar, one calendar folder. You can create additional calendars to track your projects, personal appointments, and other activities separately. But only the default calendar is going to be used for meeting requests and showing your availability to others. So this is my working calendar. Maybe it's my business calendar, and I want to create an additional calendar for my personal appointments that I don't want in this calendar. You can right-click on the calendar, the default that is, and go down to New Calendar. Then type in the name of your new calendar personal. The folder contains calendar items. It's going to be stored in the calendar folder. You can go ahead and change this if you got an epiphany and you're like, hey, I want to go ahead and create another contact folder in the contacts view, which by default you only get one contact folder, but maybe you want to create an additional one that's your personal contacts. You can go ahead and do it on the fly without leaving your current view. That's what that's about, but let's go ahead and go back because what we want to do here is calendar items stored in the calendar folder so we can get our second calendar, the personal, click okie dokie, and there we go. Go ahead and check it. Adds it over to the right-hand side, and let's schedule an appointment, like let's do it for this Friday, March the 30th. Right-click on it, go to New Appointment, and let's say it's the dentist. Oh, man. Let's say it's a cleaning. I feel better. Let's go ahead and click on the drop down arrow. Say it's going to be during lunchtime from 12 to 1. And then up in the options group, it's showing as busy. You could say you're out of the office, but since it's during lunch and it's my personal appointment, I don't really care about that. And then a reminder 15 minutes, maybe a couple of days out. I'm going to say none. And then click save and close, and there's the appointment. 
Now, when you get a lot of appointments on one and you want to compare and contrast between the two, I don't know about you, but hopping my eyes back and forth here gets me kind of woozy. So they have what's called an overlay. You can come up here and click on the arrow and you can see it says view in overlay mode. Click on it. It lays the personal calendar on top of the default one. And down below, how can you tell the difference between one calendar appointments, events, and meetings from another? Well, first of all, the one that's on top well, you can see is in green so there you go dentist appointments in green and then the second indicator is the one on top is in bold is clear the one that's behind it underneath it is faded and so that way I can say okay 12 o'clock that's where I'm going and then 8 o'clock that night I got the ghost hunting to do well let me hover over that one there you go ghost hunting so you can do it that way when you're done you can go ahead and view it side by side by clicking on it back again you can also right click on top of it, say you want a new appointment so you don't have to like separate them since you can see everything right there. But when you create the new appointment, new one, and let's do an all day event actually, and then click save and close, and it shows as free. Now we'll just say we're out of the office, then click save and close. You can see it's right there. It schedules, okay, and the reminder comes up. Let's dismiss it. I forgot to get rid of that. In any case, it's going to be on the one that's on top here. So if I want to schedule on the one behind it, then I need to get it out of overlay mode. So to do that, you can go ahead and click on the arrow to view it side by side, or you can right click and you get more options. You can see overlay is selected. If you deselect it, it goes back to the way it was. And again, right click, you've got some additional options there where you can go back to overlay. You can change the color of the calendar, rename it, copy, delete it, move it. And if you have other calendars here, well, if you want to move it up, it actually switches places. So now you can have your default calendar overlay on top of the other calendar. And you can see with the calendar on top, everything is bold and beautiful and colorful. And then the one on the bottom is faded for the dentist appointment and the new one event. And so when you're done, you can go ahead and click on the X or just uncheck it here. And because I switched it, well, the calendar gets removed. It used to be up on the top here. So if I go ahead and check it and I right click on calendar, and I move it back up. You see how it switches positions over here. So that's my priority calendar here. And since it's on top, over here in the main view, it's on the left-hand side. So top to bottom, left to right, as far as priority goes. Close out of the personal, and it's there until you want to get rid of it. If you do, just go ahead and right-click on it. Say Delete Calendar. And once you delete it, it's gone for good. The calendar group feature is only available to those who are connected to the Microsoft Exchange server. And you can see that I'm connected. And it's a collection of user calendars to view and compare schedules before scheduling a meeting. So instead of using the scheduling assistant, there's another way of doing this. And you can do it by coming up here on the Home tab to the Manage Calendars group. Click on Calendar Groups drop down arrow to create a new calendar group. Click on it. And then name your group, my homies, and then hit Enter. And then add your homies down below as group members. Double click. I just have one here in the global address list. So one homie. Click OK. And there you go. There's the name of the group. And if I added more than one person, they'd be listed down below. They'd be checked by default. And their calendars would be displaying over to the right-hand side. And I just have one homie. That's Carrie. If I don't want to see it, uncheck it. Disappears. But I do want to see it because the purpose of this is to be able to compare my calendar to hers. To say, OK, I'd like to schedule a meeting. Friday, March the 30th at 8 a.m. Oh, she's already got something scheduled at 8 a.m. And you can see when I hover over it, I get the pop-up from 8 to 9. And it says it's busy. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? Is it that important? Let me double check. Oh, you don't have permissions to view this calendar, but you could ask Carrie to share his or her calendar with you. We'll talk about that in a later training video. I want to keep it simple here and just be able to compare and contrast our calendars to see if she's available at certain days or times to be able to schedule an appointment. And so if I want to have her come to our ghost hunting adventure from 9 to, well, you can see right here in the pop-up, she says she's got something else going on at that time that's tentative. So she might be able to make it. In any case, I can still schedule the appointments and invite her to the meeting. It doesn't prevent me from doing that. It's just a heads up saying she's got something else that she might be attending. So... This is one way to look at the calendar side by side, but I think a better way is to actually do an overlay, which is to come up here and click on the arrow, and it takes her calendar and puts it on top of mine. So everything in green, you can see Carrie Heffernan's in green down below, all her appointments and meetings are in green, so you can see the difference between what she has going on, her schedule, and from her calendar, 
and for mine. Now mine's in orange, but it's being displayed as blue here, my meetings, and they're also faded. So if you want to compare and contrast and say, okay, whose is whose, the one that's in bold is the one that's on top, and the one that's faded, the one that's behind, are my appointments. So then I can really stack them up and go, okay, 8 a.m., she's busy, 9 p.m., I'm busy, and hoping that she could come, but she's got something tentative, and in any case, if it has nothing to do with what I see here, and I can see, wow, she's totally open, April the 19th. Well, then go ahead and we can remove the overlay by clicking on the arrow, or you can right-click to get some options there, and I can do the overlay again, and it puts her back on top of my calendar. And again, let's right-click and go over it and change the color for a calendar, rename the calendar, copy, delete, in any case, whatever permissions I'm given to do, at least for my view, I get options, but I can't update her calendar on her side because I don't have permissions. Let's go ahead and move that back over to the side. 19th is what she had available. Well, I don't want to make it as an event here. In any case, let me click off and just double click to open it up and then uncheck all day event. Type in the subject, go ahead and invite her and type in her email address, then send it off. And let me close out to not save it knowing that she's got nothing currently scheduled here unless it's some freaky lag time that it takes a second and I already sent her the invite and then all of a sudden it pops up here saying that she's out of the office the entire day. Well, she is here on April the 27th. And one last cool feature that I want to show you. If I find out that Carrie, and let's say we have a bunch of other homies listed here, and they're all available on the 19th and I want to go ahead and schedule an appointment for everybody whose calendar that I have here, well, in the homies, and I just have one. What you can do is come up here on the home tab to the new group, click on new meeting, and then do a new meeting for all. That means everybody's calendar that you have here that's open, click on new meeting for all, automatically adds their email address to it. Well, I just have one, Carrie, but if I had Bob and, and Slarty and Klinger and Frank, they'd be all automatically populated into the two field, making my work so much easier. And then type in the subject, location, schedule, and then click send, and away you go. And then when you're done looking at this, of course, you can uncheck it or you can go ahead and click on the X to close out of it. And then if you're like, I no longer have use for this in the folder pane here, you can right click on homies to delete the group. Are you sure you want to remove it and its contents? Yes. And of course, that's not going to stop you from reconnecting if you want to later. Just again, come back up here, manage calendars, calendar groups, and create a new one and go ahead and add them back in again. You want to make sure that you watch my message rules training video, you know, the one that we talked about how to handle incoming email messages if you want to forward them on to somebody else or move them to another folder. Well, this one's going to be about how to handle meeting responses. And it's not like it's in there that it pops out and it says, hey, I can go ahead and forward these on to somebody else or move them to another folder. And unless you know what you're looking for, you may not ever find it. I mean, eventually you will if you click and try every single rule. But let me show you how you can do it here. So the scenario is I want to schedule a meeting during dinner time from 5 to 8 o'clock and all those who accept the meeting I'll get the responses I want to automatically forward them on to Mr. Humphreys so I want a rule that will do that just for those who accept well maybe tentative because you know in case if they come at the last minute I don't want to be short on food and then when he gets those responses for accepting and or tentative he can go ahead and tally them up and go to the store the night before and purchase food accordingly or do catering in any case to go ahead and set this up up here on the home tab to the move group the rules, click on the drop down arrow to manage rules, and let's click on new rule again, assuming that you've already watched this training video on message rules. And I want to apply rule on messages that I receive, select it, click next, and then scroll down. And you tell me if you would have spotted this uses the form name form. Well, this is the one that we're going to be using to be able to flag those incoming meeting responses to accept, reject. It doesn't say that here, just this form name, right? So maybe you would have eventually would have clicked on every single one of these to find out what they did, but hey, I'm supposed to cut down on your work, at least those things that I think that are helpful. And that might be on the Microsoft exam. In any case, come down here and click on form name. It opens up and it says choose a form. We want to choose the application forms. There you go, accept meeting response. You can select it and click add. Those who decline it, double click, it adds it over here. And down at the bottom, those who are tentative. So when I'm done with this rule, when people respond to any of my meeting invites, either accept, decline, or tentative, it's going to do something. Well, not decline. I just want accept and tentative so we can forward on to Mr. Humphreys to 
We'll go low budget, just get donuts. In any case, let's click close. And you can see tentative meeting response or accept. Let's click next so we can perform the action, which is to forward it on to people or public group. So you've got to go down here and click on the link to define who that people or public group is. Well, it could be all my homies. But no, it's just Mr. Humphreys. Double click to add them down below. Click OK. So apply this rule when a message arrives that is from a meeting invite. If it's tentative or they accept it, forward on to Mr. Humphreys. Click Next. No exceptions to the rules. And I'm speeding past this because I assume that you watched the earlier training video on this. And there's the name of it. Tentative meeting response or accept meeting response. We want to FW to Mr. H for food. Okay, food. All right. Then click Finish. Click OK. Let's go to our calendar so we can schedule this. And we'll do it for Thursday, March the 1st. Right-click on it. Go to New Meeting Request. Left-click on it. And we'll type in Carrie. And I could type in additional ones, but I don't have anybody else. Just Carrie. And so down below, let's do in the evening from, because it's dinner time, 5 to, we want 3 hours to 8 o'clock. And let's see the subject. Yes. Investigation Film Footage Review. So all that ghost hunting stuff we did, well, we got to review it to see if we captured anything. Sometimes they're pretty sneaky and you don't see them right there. But when you look at the footage, they show up. In any case, go ahead and click Send. I'm not going to add a location. It's at the office. It's up to you. I'm going to send it anyways. And then I just need to go back to my mail folder and come up here, click on Send and Receive. Came in. And did it send it off to Mr. Humphreys? Because she accepted. Remember, for accepted or tentative, it needs to forward it on to Mr. Humphreys. Let me go to the sent items group and, hey, it did it. Forward it on to Mr. Humphreys. Fabulous. Well, he just has one, just needs to plan food for one and me and him. But you can imagine if we had tons of people showing up, he would get all these forwarded on to him and then he'd just get a total of all those who accepted because it would only send over those who accepted or tentative for the investigation film footage review meeting and bring enough donuts. The purpose of the journal is to track activities for personal, business, or both. And to get to the journal, to create a journal entry, just come down below in the navigation pane, click on the More button, and go to Folders. When you click on it, well, you do get the folders, including what we saw down below in the navigation pane, like your contacts, your calendar, your inbox from the mail folder, also the journal. Go ahead and click on that. And then over to the right to create a journal entry, you can right click and go to journal entry or come up here on the home tab to the new group and click on journal entry. When I come down below, click on journal entry. And some of this is going to be subjective. I mean, it's your journal, whatever you want to type in, but it does have some fields that will help when it comes to identifying or helping you label your journal. So first of all, as a subject, we could say, well, it's a ghost investigation. And then down below, what's the entry type? Is this a phone call that we got? Or actually, it was an email message that Carrie sent to me about this. So it's let's go up here. Was it a conversation? Is the entry about a document? Well, it's an email message. Then the company, type in the name of the company if it has anything to do with the company that you want to keep track of. And then the entry time is, there's the date, there's the time. If you need to update that, maybe it's about the time when you got the email message a week ago that you want to go ahead and start including this, that you want to mark it off from that date and that time. Go ahead and click on that, come up here. You can change the time, maybe it's 04. And then the duration, if it's billable hours, you know, you're billing somebody for the time that you worked on since you got the email message, you can go ahead and click on the drop down arrow and choose the time. Like if it's 55 minutes, I suppose you'd choose five and then come up here and add a, another five. But if I go back to zero, here's something that's cool. You can actually come up here in the timer group and click on start timer. When I do that, it starts ticking off the seconds until it gets to a minute. You won't see it. There's no dancing timer out here going, hey, here's one second, two second, three seconds. When it hits one minute, it'll change it to one minute. And I'm going to make you suffer and watch the entire time until that turns to one minute. Because I don't want to suffer alone. You're going to have to watch it with me. Oh, never mind. I'll go ahead and through the miracle of video editing, take out the extra seconds. So that was a fast minute. In any case, it's still ticking off, so it's going up to the second minute. So unless I pause the timer, it goes on forever. 
And then when I'm done, I can click Save, Save and Close, and then let me save and close it. And there it is, Ghost Investigation. Double click to open it back up. And when I click on Start Timer, it picks up from where it last left off. So if it was a minute and five seconds, well, I can't tell if it was five, 10, 20 seconds beyond the minute, but it remembers. So when I click on Start Timer, again, it keeps track of the amount of time that I'm working in the journal here. If that's how you want to measure it, you can do it that way. But if I come over here and I pause the timer and I say, mm, no, I want to change it and I go to 30 minutes, it resets it. So when I click on Start Timer, it goes from 30 minutes to 30 minutes and one second, two second, three seconds. That's the benchmark. That's where it starts. So if you want to start from the beginning, then go back to the beginning zero. Now, since I messed it up, I have to start over. But I'm not going to go through that ordeal again. We got the concept. And you get other options up here. You can tag it, categorize it, mark it as private. You can also insert additional things. But where do you insert it? Of course, down below in the notes field. And you can type additional notes, something like, there you go. And if you want to get more specific, you can, or this is what I do, is I come over here and I type in today's date and time because if I got several entries within my journal entry, then I do want to keep track of that separately. Let me, let me make it bold. And then so, you know, close out of here tomorrow, March the 28th, type in the date, the time that I logged in, and then dash dash, and then another note when I come back to touch this journal entry again. So I can get more particular. In any case, that's up to you. So you can go ahead and type in notes as well as well, up here in the include group, you can attach a file, an Outlook item, which was the email message that Carrie sent to me about the ghost investigation. Click on it. And there it is right there. Double click on it. So I got the original message here, one stop shopping. I can go ahead and double click on it. And there we go. They're friendly. Hope that doesn't change. So I don't have to bounce around and go to the inbox going, what was that message again? I can insert that as an Outlook item here. Also attach files, documents. Let me close out of there. Business cards. So if I need to call Carrie, oh, there she is. Let me go ahead and click off the email message, hit enter, and then the business card to Carrie. So there we go. Need to give her a call. What's her phone number again? Or maybe she's got an alternate number because she's not picking up on her mobile. You can go ahead and double click. Again, it's great because once you insert it, you don't have to leave here. I'm not going to save the changes here to go out and hunt for the email, hunt for her contact information. It's fabulous. I mean, it's like opening up her contact in the notes part of the contact and typing all this in and keeping track of it that way. But then I'm not sure I want to put these separate investigations all in her contacts notes field. Instead, I can journal it here. And then you can come up here, illustration, so you can do fancy pictures. Let me click off that, hit enter. Pretty much what we've done in earlier training videos, like in a contact, it's the same thing here as far as the steps go. I mean, you can do online pictures and say, hey, okay, I got to search Bing. Let's type in happy ghost, hit enter. Oh, great. Let me type it in again. Happy ghost, hit enter. There we go. Oh, he's happy. Let's select him, click on insert, and oh, he's huge. Hover over the, in this case, the top right-hand corner resizing handle. Click and drag to push him in. Oh, now we're rotating him. He's now smiling the other way. Now he's flipping back. i got to make sure I do this right here. There we go. You can do it that way. Or as we talked about in earlier training videos, the point being is that you can go ahead and enter specific details about your journal, including pictures, email messages, other Outlook items, contacts, even tasks. You can insert that as well, categorize it, and then when you're done, go ahead and click Save and Close. And it's right there. Now, if you can't find it because, well, let me scroll over here, and you're looking for a specific journal entry, it is logged by date, so you just can go to today's date here. But you can come up here and click Search and do Ghost. Hey, there it is, and it actually changes view. It goes from, well, let me come up here and show you. Click on the View tab and close out of here. It goes from the timeline view to the entry list, and it specifically pulls in, well, I only have one entry, that one entry. So if I go to the entry list, there you go. It's all stacked here, and it's sorted by the start date. And if I went to the phone calls, well, it's not a phone call. It's an email message, so that's not going to show last seven days. Let's go back to the timeline. Whoops. Okay, we want to go back to the timeline. There we go. We just had to give it a nudge. And then, of course, you can right-click on it if you want to delete it, do some other quick options like to categorize it or to change categories, forward it on to somebody, quick print, copy, and open it up. And you can also delete it here as well, forward it there.
Learning how to create a task in Outlook is okay, but assigning it to somebody else, uh, passing the buck, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing. Well, let's go ahead and create our task. Now, I'm in the task folder, and it doesn't matter if you're in the task or the to-do list up here in the folder pane, because you can create it one or the other. Again, a quick recap, the reason why you have the two separate options here, or views as it were, is because this is just strictly for task, where the to-do list contains not only task, but any other Outlook item that you flag that needs to be completed. So if you want everything that you got to do in one view, the to-do list, that includes the task. But if you just want to focus on the task and not all the other Outlook flagged items, then go to the task view. So let's come over here and double click in a blank area. There's the task tab and the subject. Let's do something really spooky. Cleaning out the company fridge. Oh, that's horrifying. Let's go ahead and set the start date. It's got to be started today. And it's got to be completed by Friday before the weekend because nobody's here and things could turn really nasty. In fact, let me come down in the notes field because when I assign this to somebody, I want them to know where I'm coming from. Captain's log star date today, finding other odd smells more than usual when opening the fridge today along with some fruit with white beards and green slime oozing out of a Tupperware container. Ew. Grody to the max. In any case, that's going to go along with this assignment. And so let me come up here on the Task tab to the Manage Task group and click on Assign. When I click on it, a couple of things. First of all, up at the top before this, it was due in three days. So that's good to know, and they'll see that. And down below, the To field, we can go ahead and type in the email address of Mr. Humphreys. There we go. Of course, it's up to him whether he accepts it or rejects it, which brings up a good point. When you assign a task to somebody, it gets deleted from your task list and is assigned to the person if they accept it. But if not, then upon return of the declined task, you have the option to put it back into your task list or pass the buck on to somebody else. So we got Mr. Humphreys here. And then down below, we've got two additional options that come with assigning this, where you can keep an updated copy of this task on your task list. So in the task folder, it'll have a task there that anytime they make an update, like with the percent complete, 5%, 10%, you'll see that so you can keep tabs on them. And then you can have a, an entire status report sent to you when the task is completed. So if you don't want those options, you can uncheck them. I'll leave them checked, and we'll cover these in a later training video. Right now, we just want to get it out of our hair and assign it on to somebody else and show you how to do that. All right, let's get this out of here. Click on Send. Oh, and we got the spell checker. Ew. Okay, look, ignore all. We want it out of here. And then you can see we've got the little dude and it's got an arrow pointing over saying that we're trying to assign it to somebody. And because I have it checked as well that I want status updates, if he does accept it, I want to be able to double click to open this up to find out. And you can see here, well, he hasn't accepted it yet. You can see up in the information area, waiting for a response from the recipient. And then down below, if he does accept, when he starts it, it'll say started and then the percent complete. And you can see up here in the Manage Task Group, Send Status Report. We'll talk about that later on, as well as I'll show you what happens when it does get updated after they accept it. So let's move to the next training video to see what it looks like when somebody sends you an assigned task and how you can accept or reject that, what that looks like. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.